Good day and welcome to today's episode of The Focus. I'm Aldu. And I'm Horia. And today we want to welcome uh, somebody I've met a few years ago in a, in a building in Wellington, um, Clark Ching. Now, Clark is famous for a few things and we'll get into some of that. But um, I've met Clark um, at a client and we had a really interesting chat uh, around uh, ways of working and new ways of working and he is really uh, he's actually an author that um, has written a few books that we'll get into a little bit but um, he he has got quite a lot of experience in dealing with organizations in the oversight and governance uh, domain as well so he's going to share some of his war stories with us today but before I uh, I tell all of it, um, Clark, why don't you give us a little bit of background of your your river of life or your life story? Um, right. Yeah. Welcome. Okay. Right. Well, thank you. Lovely to uh, lovely to, to 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 chat with you guys and everyone who's listening or watching. Um, so I live in Nelson, New Zealand, and I grew up here. Uh, and then finally, about five years ago, I managed to uh, return back. Uh, and so I do not, not so much consulting as mentoring for, for um, managers and executives who are trying to take the agile stuff and actually make it work in the real world. And my speciality is the theory of constraints. So that, that's the stuff. If I do um yeah I've got the the, the books there but um, I suppose my story is I was a left-brained computer scientist uh who accidentally read uh, do I have a copy of it I do accidentally read uh, a business novel uh the goal um in about 1996 97 I become hooked on TOC theory of constraints and it was it was it was the most frustrating thing um because I learned it and I immersed myself um, in this world I didn't understand of manufacturing. And so I, I, I so my background really is computer science uh, and then theoretical factory manager. <laughs> um, and I learned all of the, the theory of constraints. I went so deep and wide in that. And I, I just became you know, expert level, but only at the knowledge level, not at the practitioner level. That 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 took time. And then in 2002 or three. Um, uh, as Agile was just starting to become something that you vaguely heard about, uh, some now friends of mine started Agile Scotland, the local um, Agile Scotland user group. And then um, the guy that was running it a, a, a month or so later uh, left Scotland and moved where I was living at the time um, and handed over to me Agile Scotland. And I ran it for quite a long time. Uh, but I started in that again at a theoretical level, not knowing anything about it. But what, what I loved about what I learned about Agile um, is that it combined a lot of the stuff from the theory of constraints um, that I'd learned about already um, and a lot of stuff from Lean and obviously a lot of stuff from the total quality um, movement uh, and all of those things that over time have you know, um, uh, changed in names and, and, and uh, become six sigmaized and all that. But you know, a lot of the really fundamental stuff that it kind of, there was a Venn diagram uh, there of, of those three things and the middle of it was agile. And then if you put in um, computer science and, and software development and projects and all that stuff in it, it was just like, oh, it's finally arrived. So that, that was when I started to be able to actually practice it. And I learned Agile, but I, I come to Agile um, from a, a background that's different to most people and that I came there prepackaged with all of this stuff that I could make sense of in this theoretical factory. But I then had to figure out how to make sense of it in the, the real world. So I, I do TOC first um, and, then, and then Agile um, second, you know, kind of in, in, in that order. And, and that's... Whereas a lot of the people that are picking up TOC have, you know, come to it a bit later, are starting from the, you know, they're going the other direction. Mm. So it's really good. But the, the fundamental thing is that there's a huge difference um, between book knowledge um, and the, the real world. Um, and I, I think that's the thing that I do most these days is, is just helping. 
I, I started off um, as a computer scientist, very left brain. And, and over the years, I realized that the thing that was limiting me the most was my ability to basically help managers. So I, I started figuring out how to get good at that. And, and hence, that's why writing books and, and stuff like that was figuring out how to communicate with um, with with people and to turn this sort of left brain dork into a bit more um, user friendly fifty year old uh, something. Um, but that's that's my story, I, I guess. Computer scientist to um, fifty year old dork. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Clark, uh, well, th- th- that uh, that description of what you just uh, talked about yourself is probably. Uh, has provided quite a lot of um, background and and good um, uh, a good foundation for you to write your books. Um, so I remember you you gave me this book uh, in our chat, yes. Rolling Rocks Downhill. But you've written a few books on uh, on the back of that. Mm. So what I wanted to uh, ask you is, uh, what inspired you to write uh, write these books? Right. Uh... So I suppose I've, just, I've got them here, of course. So if I just run through, there's a couple of other books that are um, less well known, but Rolling Rocks Downhill, if I can get that one there. If anyone wants to, to read any of these for free, um, just find me on LinkedIn and just send me a message. Um, very happy to, 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 to have as many people read them. I, I make my money from, uh, not from book writing. <laughs> it's not a very good way to make money. Um, uh, so Rolling Rocks Downhill, the, the, the inspiration behind that um it was it was there, there were two bits one is that in the early days of agile it was really 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 it was geek central um and, and that's cool it's still you know it's still it still is it was programmers it was extreme programmers um there was a bit of scrum going on um there, there was there's all these things and and when i got i i, I was one of the first people outside of the states to get scrum training which was really cool and I love that I'd done an MBA um and I go wow I, I got more I think out of three days with Ken Schwaber um career-wise than I did out of three years of an MBA um and it was like wow but this of course was the early stages and, and, but there was a there's this recurring thing that I, I noticed that made me feel uncomfortable is that in the theory constraints we're very holistic and we're very management um friendly we're everyone friendly um, but it's kind of it's management stuff and it's about making a workplace that's nice to work in um, and and profitable and yet in the agile stuff in about 2003-ish when I was getting into it it, it was really 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 technical and there was a sort of like gap that, that it felt like it was actually making it wider it was it was taking the agile stuff was was almost pushing away managers and uh, uh, um, I think Ken is quite well known for really disliking uh managers and 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 that came through even way back then in the xp people they were trying to get rid of everyone except for programmers um (laughs) and so i decided to write a book which was about the the the, you know which was a business novel which is uh you know like the 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 goal my inspiration was a business novel and i decided to write a book that explained the effectively the business case um for small batches um and, and managing your bottleneck um, in, in software development. So don't do big projects, do little projects. Um, and, and, and that was kind of effectively the message in it, but you have to start when you um, write this stuff and immerse people in a story um, that they then have to, you know, that you set up and, and the only way out of it is not to do the same old thing that everyone else does, um, uh, but to actually you know, turn on a few light bulbs. And, 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 and that's what I did. It took me a long time to write that book. And honestly, the value... Um, it took 10 years to write it, you know, like five five different versions of it as I got better and better at writing. And I finally got to a point where I wasn't embarrassed by it. Um, <laughs> but the actual learning you get from writing a book is incredible. And I would recommend everyone that they do it, um, but, not, uh, uh, but not the 10-year version. <laughs> so so that, that's what this was written for. This, this was written for um, the, the management and executive level um, version of Agile. How do you make money? from agile how do you live deliver projects on time um if time's important um and, and make man, money from it and and i was trying to fill that gap and the funny thing about that is people still read it now a, a lot of agile people in the middle of agile projects they read it and then they come back and they say um, i really enjoy that story but 
this was supposed to be pre-agile. Our projects still look like the stuff that's going on in this book. Yeah. There was a, a big lesson I got personally, and it's effectively the lesson that is in this book, ironically, is that if you're going to write books or do projects, do lots of small ones <laughs> than big ones. Um, and so that's a wee while later. Um, uh, one of the frustrations I had, I'm just trying to get the focus right there. For anyone who's listening to this and wondering what's going on, I'm holding a book here that's just now come to focus called The Bottleneck Rules. And it's a little, rare, it's a small book about, I'm not sure, 17, 18,000 words in it. And, and I wrote that because I got really frustrated, um, so frustrated, and I would try and get all of these um, agile people, agile coaches uh, who come in, I was trying to get them to read the goal, you know, which is the theory constraints, so that they could understand this bigger view of the world, not, not just the bottleneck stuff, but this bigger view of it. Um, that you know you're running a business and and the the factory or the the, the technical um stuff of it is just a subset of that um but i also wanted them to understand the idea of bottlenecks and how getting them in the right place is so important and i couldn't get them to read the book I, I i could get people to buy the book i could give them a copy of the book but to get most people to sit down and read a 400 page novel written um about a factory uh in the 1970s was a really 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 hard sell so i i wrote this one the bottleneck rules which is you know like maybe an hour an hour and a half's reading and um i think if i have a, a special skill i wasn't born with it i've developed it is that i can write really engaging um little, little stories that get stuff through so this one isn't a like a business novel it isn't it, but it's a collection of stories and, and it just explains the, the the bottleneck part of the theory constraints in and just just using small words and really relatable examples and um it's done really well actually it was in the 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 guardian magazine uh, the guardian newspaper um which was a really nice surprise when that happened and um in the spectator magazine as well so that's done well and then there's this other one i won't talk so much about this but th this is probably if i could get everyone to read this world would be a better place uh, it's called corkscrew solutions and it's about how to essentially how to come up with win-win solutions, which I know is such a cliche, but it, it's a method and it comes from Ellie Goldred originally is where I learned the technique. And I've just simplified it. He called it the evaporating cloud. But there's a guy called Roger L. Martin, who's an extraordinary um, business writer who stumbled across the, the, the same technique, um, didn't know about Goldred stuff, and he called it integrative thinking. Um, and this is my simplified version of, of, of that. Honestly, if, if, if people only, if, if anyone wants to copy this, uh, read it and then do something that um, is not one of those weird things. Actually use it. It's, it's just a great way of when people are taking sides on an issue or even in your own head where you're torn between something and you're taking this side and then the other side. I have one. Should I get a new MacBook Air? No, I shouldn't. Um, and then going through and then having this debate in your head. I've, I've taken those um those those conflicts and using the conflicts to come up with really clever um and after the fact really obvious solutions so, mm. so that, that that's the that's the three main books thank you for that clark um for the rundown and um and oh top dad <laughs> His mug has got top dad on it. Okay, uh, thank you, <laughs> thank you for that. And uh, I must say, when I read uh, Rolling Rocks Downhill, it was actually a, quite an easy read. It flowed quite easily. It wasn't as difficult reading as 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 the goal. I cheated a little bit and listened to the goal on audiobook, uh, and that worked a lot better. Uh, so, <laughs> I think maybe one of the differences between the two books is that Ellie told me, you know, he deliberately wrote it as a, it, was, it was the world's longest sales pamphlet. Um, so it was largely, it was he, the guy that he got to write it wrote a really interesting story, but he tried deliberately to obfuscate the stuff because at the time he was trying to sell a software package mm. that, that did the theory constraints, scheduling stuff for factories. Um, whereas me, I, I genuinely was just trying to, to, to share this wonderful stuff about Agile and go, hey, look, it solves these big, business problems um and but he probably died with a lot more money than, than i will so <laughs> <laughs> it's well, a bit of a different yeah. very good 
Very good. So the the the, um, the the book covers quite a lot of, or that your, your books cover quite a lot of key ideas and and so on. But what's your favorite three ideas from these books? Oh, okay. So actually, if I maybe just take one from from each. Um, it's up to you. In fact, no, I want to tell you a different one. Um, that's from another book that I I wrote. Um, called Rocks into Gold, and it's a little tiny book. Uh, and, and there's just one little little bit in it that the it, it's a story. Um, and this guy he comes up with. Uh, I, I won't even tell you about the details. There's this very nerdy, technical kind of programmer guy whose business is about to be closed down because of a um, an impending recession. Uh, and and his cust the customers of their business are just shutting down everything. And he figures out a way of making more money, um, essentially by using a, a very brute force version of Agile. Um, instead of doing a big project, do four small ones. Um, and then at the end of it, the, the his boss, the owner of this company, says to him, Bob, how did you come up with this, um, th th this amazingly clever idea? And he just said, well, I, I looked at what I wanted, which was to save our jobs. And then I figured out how to get what I wanted by getting other people what they wanted. And, and so I think I didn't realize it until much, much later that that was effectively a, a, you know, a style of helping people. You get what you want um, by helping the other people solve their problems. So I, I think that's, a, you know, it's almost like it almost belongs on a cup. Um, you know, the side of a cup uh, is a philosophy of of um, it's a philosophy. Not everyone would agree with it, but um that, that was that one. Um, this one here, where is it? The bottleneck rules. There's something in here that's um, different. So, so I, I think if there's something that anyone took away from this, there's something that's actually not in, in the book, um, considering our audience. So to take away, yes, the idea, every system has a bottleneck. So there's one narrowest point in the pipeline and every system um, has one of those, but in software development, you actually want to deliberately place the bottleneck um, to be your developers. And you want to have plenty of capacity stacked up in the other roles around them um, so that the developers are never starved of fuel, um, just bottleneck stuff 101, that, that they never got the people who are upstream of them, analysts, customers, and so on, who are um, prioritizing work um, or passing low quality work into the developers so that they, um, uh, just to keep them busy. Um, and you want on the other side of it, you never want your testers um, ideally to be really slow so that the developers have to wait for, for feedback from testers um, and they start other stuff and raise their whip. So it, it's just, it, if, if I didn't even use the word bottleneck here, you just go, oh, look, you want everyone else to have plenty of time to make sure that the developers um, spend plenty of time doing good development on good quality, high, high value um, inputs. And, and so I, it, it's not in this book. Um, the idea of it is that you have strategic bottlenecks and, and that's the most important thing uh, that I think I know. Um, and it's also counterintuitive because most places have the exact opposite. They have far too many um, developers. Uh, they don't realize it, but they think they want to go faster. They add more developers. Um, but it's all the other roles that are around them and how they coordinate and collaborate, which makes a difference. Um, so that's the, the second one uh, from that. I'm just trying to think, what would I take out of this? See, I... I would actually take a real meta lesson from this um, that's not in here, but there are there's two techniques in this book, which is part of the writing and the communicating, which just, they, 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 they make you clever, 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 cleverer than you may ever actually, um, may, may actually deserve to be. Um, one is that if you tell stories, uh, then stories, they, they just drag you through. Story, stories are lovely um, in that they, they people will listen to a story and, and they won't react to it and, and, and argue against it. it just, it's like, almost like it, it sneaks in past the barriers of people's brains yeah. um, that push back, especially if you structure it right. And, and so um, there's this book, for instance, it, it follows um, the, the, you know, the, the standard architecture of, of, a, of, a, good, um, of a good commercial 
uh, novel, and, and it's just, you know, it's got four quarters, um, uh, three acts, in the middle there's a light bulb moment where everything changes and the story changes direction. Learning how to tell stories is such a superpower, but just don't do it by trying to write a business novel to start with. Um, it's, it's the craziest thing. The second thing is that if there's any technique, forget everything I know, if there's any technique that um, that I would recommend anyone get good at, and the only way you can get good at it is just to try it and practice um, uh, to solve any problem that's novel um, is analogy. Um, so solve your problems by finding something that's very similar to the problem that you're currently facing, but in a different environment. Yeah. Um, and go find it there. And, and the hardest bit is to find the analogy often. And then when you do solve it in that environment, you'll probably find it's already solved. Yeah. And then move your head back to your place and you go, oh, I've got the principles and I know how to apply them. So that honestly, it's a real, real superpower being able to do that. And, and, and it's actually easy to learn. It's just that no one will teach it to you. Thank you for that, Clark. Um, that, uh, so those ideas, um, we, we, we talked a little bit about oversight and we understand that these tensions between these new ways of working and uh, the, mm -hmm. uh, the traditional governance and oversight functions. How does your ideas or those three things or the ideas from your books or the ideas of theory of constraints address this tension between those two areas? Uh, so I, I have a, a model that, that sits over all of the agile stuff um, and it's called the ATM, the agile TOC method, right? Um, yeah. and, and one of the things in that, it, it collects, it, it assumes you're already doing agile of some sort and then it um, helps you create a productive, calm, profitable in, environment. And, and there's one thing in there that it's not directly answering your question, but I think it's it's just it's um, it's one change which makes a huge huge difference, and it does fit with the oversight stuff because we're looking at not not what goes on on the ground and how people you know get their hands dirty at the coal face and all that kind of stuff, but we're looking at at, at governance and managing the whole thing. It, one of the nine principles, I suppose you could call them, um, that's on the model is dollarize the price. Mm. And what it basically is saying is um, if you're going to work on a big project um, or if you've got a if you've, you've got a team that doesn't like working in projects but they're working um, trying to make money for you know one product or, or, or whatever or even if you haven't got um, you're in a you're in a non-profit environment, uh, not for profit environment, um, still dollarizing and and trying to at least quantify to a certain extent what you're working on. Um, it, it often changes, it, it almost always changes what you end up doing if you actually clarify what the prize is that you are chasing. Um, and, and, and when you do that, uh, it means that everything from the top down becomes a whole lot more aligned um, with everything. And if I can just give you an example, um, and, and I'll give you an analogy that, that, that helps make that sense. And just keep in mind, that I mostly work at the principal level and I help give people light bulbs and see things differently. And then I help them figure out how to put it in real life. But like you were saying before we started talking, it's all situational. Um, it's just, yeah, you know, I see something different. Um, so I do something different. So with one of my clients um, and one of the divisions of about 300 people working in it um, and they're making hundreds of millions a, a year, you know, so they're doing quite well for themselves. Um, one of the gaps between what the business goals are and what the team goals are, and this is really common, is that the business is trying to make money now um, and in the future. You know, not, not just short-term money, now and in the future, and they're trying to make money. Um, and the product teams, uh, the product managers, are trying to build the best product. It seems strange. You would think that that... If everyone builds the best product, that would add up to be to make the most money, um, but it, it doesn't. Um, and I'll just just give you a, an example. This this now if people I happen to have two cups here, which is fortunate. So I've got two mugs here, and I'm holding them in front of this thing. So anyone's listening, um, you see a little tiny uh, Starbucks espresso cup, and I've got a much bigger um, mug here. Um, 
one of the things that's really, really common is that in products, they try and build the best product or the best feature. And what they tend to do, it's, it's like is that if they were to go along to Starbucks and uh, order coffee, they, they wouldn't order just the espresso because that's quite bitter tasting uh, to them. But they're building the best product. So they go in and they'll order, I want some you know, coffee and I want um, sprinkles on it and I want syrup and I want some foamed milk and some whipped cream and in New Zealand and no one knows why um, a chocolate fish uh, on the side of it and <laughs> I was wondering it. about that too <laughs> the chocolate fish no one knows it, but it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and you, you can imagine this thing and, and they're going look this is the best this is going to be the biggest and the best cup of coffee in the world and, and that kind of is for a lot of product people what they're aiming for um, whether it be a product or a feature they're trying to build the biggest thing um, and, and, and what you find, though, is that most businesses and most users um, are actually chasing that they, 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 they're not looking for the biggest, most fancy cup of coffee. They um, they craving caffeine because they're tired um, and they want the espresso. So there's a, a gap there. The espresso was the bit that gives them the most value and the most profit uh, out of this. What most um, product teams are actually building way too big a coffee and they need to pair it back. And so if you look at the Starbucks and see the different, many different sizes of coffee, um, there's one above Venti that you, you um, that, that's just like a huge cup of coffee. It's bigger than a bottle of wine. Um, <laughs> and, and most product people instinctively don't build that because it seems so ridiculously large. They, they naturally bring it down to a grande size. But what we should be doing if we want to um, uh, make more money is we should be dollarizing the price or in coffee terms, identifying what the espresso is that we're actually um, chasing. And then we should start not from the big <coughs> version and work down, but we identify the bare minimum, um, the espresso, and then we add a little bit of extra stuff onto it and, and build up to a slightly bigger cup um, so that it's, it is more palatable for most people. Mm. And, and if we don't know what we're chasing, then we'll have different levels of the organization chasing different things. Yeah. Um, so, and that becomes very messy. So, so there's a few things that I just want to uh, rewind. The first thing is, yeah. is that there should be, from an oversight perspective, they should make sure that there's line of sight and alignment between the organizational goal or vision or whatever yeah. and the product or service or project, whatever. Okay, so yes. that's, that's yeah. the first thing I, I picked up. Another thing that oversight capability or oversight people need to pick up as well is to look for over-engineering because you've explained over-engineering and yep. you probably worked in software where it's so nice and cool to add additional whistles and bells and bling and whatever the case might be. And then you find out the customer doesn't use it anyway. Yes. Okay. So, so um, that, that guard against over-engineer, and the only way you do that is by the incremental development of your product, very much yeah. like... Yeah, it is incremental, but there's also the thinking that goes on before you start building stuff incrementally. Yeah. You actually go, what's the espresso? Um, what is the espresso? What are we chasing? So that's what I call dollarizing the price. You actually, And it doesn't necessarily have to have dollars on it, and you can certainly hardly ever going to actually come up with a an actual dollar figure that's accurate mm -hmm. but you'll get in the right ballpark but the main thing is that people understand um everyone understands this is what we're, we're, we're chasing and that as a business we have decided that we would rather have um one venti cup for one um feature because it warrants that that um, but the rest of them we'd rather have um, five espresso cups and we can get all of those for the same price as we can for one of those really big um, mm. fully featured things here so so but then build it incrementally yeah it, it's okay. think first and then build yeah so you talk about dollarization i'm just curious is that over the last few episodes we've talked about um, finding a way of expressing value that's not just expressed as a dollar value mm -hmm. um, and uh, i know that uh, you, when you talk about dollarizing it um do you look at more of a value score than an actual return on investment calculation? Yeah. So um, just, just like estimating anything is what you're doing at the beginning. Um, actually, there's a funny thing that you know, if you're estimating time, quite often you can actually figure out what the actual value was. When you're estimating value, 
quite often you can't figure out what the actual value was. Um, but um, the, the same with estimating time. If you're working in a project, you can quite often estimate which quarter it, it might be ready to be released, um, but not which day. Mm. It's the same thing. Um, so, so for example, if I, I give you, I, I like this example because it got quite big numbers in it. Um, uh, it was a project d delivered by a vendor, and it was in 2007, just before the financial crisis uh, kind of kicked off. And this this company was working. They they did a mortgage system which was used by a big <coughs> bank. And the big bank um, came to them that basically said, look, um, we can't use this mortgage. We want to use this really clever calculation algorithm thing. Um, and we and we want to run it against all our customers. Um, but we are the biggest, one of the banks in our group is the biggest bank in, in, in the country. And it can't, um, we know it won't run overnight because we've tried. The overnight batch to apply this calculation will take two or three days. So their functional requirement was essentially make the overnight batch run overnight for this many, you know, half a million customers. Um, so, so that you know, all, all good technical stuff, and they sit down and they look at it, right? And they go, "Yeah, that's brilliant, cool, got that." And then, um, and I'll, I'll explain. This is why the dollarization is so important. Then I'll, I'll come back to the, the calculation part of it. Um, then they got me in because they promised to do it in an agile way because the relationship between the two lots was a disaster and they tried everything else and then they said, we'll do it in an agile way. And then we said, we better get someone that knows agile. <laughs> so they got me in and I was the, the you know, the, 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 the manager of, of this. And then on the bank side, who was the customer, they had a new program manager um, had been appointed. And they say he was earning um, hundred thousand pounds a year. Let's just say that was a number. He came in and he looked at this and he thought, they're paying this vendor a million dollars for this. That sounds a bit pricey. So he sat down and started having discussions to try and get that down to 800,000. So he's trying to save 200,000 um, there. And it was really good, good, very sensible move on his part. He was coming in trying to um, say, hey, look, I'll give you, um, you pay me that a year, but I'll get that back, double that back um, uh, and show you how valuable I am to the, to the company. And you know, it was real money. Um, the only trouble was when when this when he started doing this, everything slowed down. And there were all sorts of debates going on, and I just happened to uh, say to the um, to, to to someone, how, "How much is this worth when you go live?" Just just interested because I don't know anything about the product. What are you doing? They go, "Oh, we've got roughly half a million dollars, um, half a million customers, and they pay us this many thousand dollars." Um, a year in interest and this is the equivalent of like um, bumping the interest rate up you know by half a percent but we, we don't have to do that the algorithm gives us that value and we 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 go oh so the value for this is somewhere between 1 million and 10 million pounds a week they go yes and it's like why are we discussing 200 000 pounds which has already delayed us three or four weeks and it's like oh so you see that the dollarization there is just giving a framework, yeah. one million to ten million. That's a really broad range, um, but it's suddenly it's got the number of zeros in there, and then you can and you just go the two hundred thousand is just it's just it's just not worth talking about. We should be talking about how we get this live, and so it just helps make people make better decisions. Um, and, and for the moment we did that, we took that everyone thought that project would take eighteen months to two to two years, and we got it in a nine months. Um, largely because they suddenly understood how much money they were losing um, by um, trivia. Uh, so that's why dollarization is important. I think that, that 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 angle, what are you chasing? And I know you can be purposeful about things. And so in my ATM model, I have like a calm, productive workplace, a thriving workplace, all that kind of stuff. The, the money stuff is important, though, because it helps you focus. Um, and, and at the end of the day, um, no one wants to work in, in a company that's going broke um because it's a really horrible place to work um so the money stuff is it's more than oxygen um the, the the money stuff is good if you work in a place that's got money and someone leaves you can replace them quickly um if you focus on um making sure that your projects actually give you a lot of espresso, espresso for your buck um you can create a, a nice working environment it's yes. not mandatory that you do but it's a good idea if you do very good or one thing that um, <clears throat> puzzles me is mm -hmm. in the social sector, 
Mm -hmm. Most of the time, we're not chasing the profit. We're not chasing money as such. Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> the idea of dollarizing the prize uh, triggers a lot of, um, shall we say, potentially adverse reactions uh, from people. It's like, no, that's not us. You don't understand. We're about service. We're about um, mm -hmm. outcome for specific uh, communities and, and so on. So <clears throat> given that, I'm wondering what alternative lenses or, or ways of framing the conversation can we inspire people to consider to achieve a similar yeah. focus you, you've got this the same uh, the, the, it's the same stuff um but you might if, if you're a hospital you might um target waiting times you might target the number of people um who are actually served um you you might target all those all of those things but at the same time you still have money because because money is paying for this stuff um in most organizations so like when aldo and i met um it was in a government department for instance, and one of the big projects that neither of us um, were, were involved in, um, uh, <clears throat> a multi-million dollar budget shortfall in one particular area. Uh, and so they were doing a lot of automation stuff to, to, to try, they were investing millions um, uh, to spend it to try and um, automate stuff to, 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 make, um, to make up for a shortfall in, in staffing. So at that stage, there it was about money, and, and I, I, I uh, it's like, um, but but maybe it's not bang for buck, which is like we're trying to optimize the amount of money that we get out of it um, to to bring in because we're not bringing in revenue. Um, may, maybe it is sometimes that we're trying to optimize the number of staff we um, we're able to serve, the number of hospitals, the number of kids we're able to teach, those kind of top level things. But there was always a, an investment and an operating expense. Um, uh, which has dollar signs or euros or pounds or, or whatever on it. And so rather than bang for buck, which is focused on getting the most value out of it, um, you, you effectively you, you have a, um, a value for money equation where you've got this much money and you're trying to squeeze as much value out of it. That, that might sound a bit funny. In, in a business, you're, you're trying to um, increase your revenue um, and make a lot more money. In a commercial thing, you're off, in a non commercial, you're often trying to make as much as you can out of it. And, and the money um, always comes into it, especially in our work. If we're working um, in, in, in an area where it's got software development, for instance, you know, that, that's the area um, that, 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 that I know. Um, uh, if you're working in that, area and even if it's doing a social service of some um sort uh we're often spending squazillions of um dollars uh on building stuff uh and so this is actually effectively we need to be e efficient so, so like the, the the coffee cup analogy applies in both of those cases um that said um there's an awful lot of stuff that you can do like with the theory of constraints um, and lean stuff uh, where you can help doctors, um, you know, just tweak a little bit. Um, and in New Zealand, we're not um, that mostly not motivated uh, by profit. Um, they're all paid, paid salaries, and you can tweak processes, find the bottleneck in the system, and get a lot more work out of um, a lot, lot more. Not work, you get probably less work. Um, but a lot more value out of the system, a lot more patience seen, um, just by making sure that the bottleneck's managed. My, my wife did that years ago and didn't really even tell me, but she took, took over a new job as she's a doctor and she had um, three people, she, she was working three days a week and her predecessor had worked five days a week and they had a, it was a 26 week, a six month long backlog to see the, the consultant. It was that's a long time to wait. You've got something wrong with you, and she went in there and working three days a week rather than five days a week. She goes, "This is just going to get worse and worse and worse." So, um, all of that stuff while we were out on dates, that I told her about the theory of constraints to you know to try and um, show how romantic I was. She, it turns out that she was actually listening, not just drinking the wine and going, "Oh, I wish it'd stop." Um, <laughs> but she actually found the bottleneck and she managed it uh, using common sense um stuff around the bottleneck and she did you know her equivalent of the coffee cup thing um uh she did some coordination stuff uh which involved doing things in a slightly different order and 
she got her waiting list down uh, to 12 weeks um, from 26. So from 26 to down to 12 weeks um, with three fifths of the actual capacity That's in, in yeah. her job. So yeah, so so in that case, you 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 measure um you you, you measure the throughput of um customers that or patients that get looked after. Mm-hmm. But that's it. I I I try not to help those um people because I find that the people who actually uh, it, it's a lot easier to work with um you know places that that are struggling um you know financially because they're a lot e- they 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 find it easier to make um some of the changes you know, there's a bit more of a sense of urgency yeah they're more um, motivated <laughs> yeah yeah and, and you know they're not protected by government that 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 you know that, that's probably obliged to keep people working there um so much so there's a bit more mm. there's a bit the pencils are a bit sharpener sharpened so that example that you've used with your wife's uh, practice or a con- uh, her being a mm-hmm. con- uh, medical consultant, um, so those processes and things that she she needed to to go through, that's probably mm-hmm. quite a lot of unnecessary oversight uh, or well, let's call it bureaucracy, um, for for lack of a better word. Um, and I think one of the, the key things, uh, uh, the two examples you've explained previously, points me to, again, this thing we know, that oversight is not just there to prevent bad stuff from happening, but also to look at asking questions about what can we do to improve. We have rules that were put in place 15 years ago. Are they still valid today? Mm. Um, so the oversight capability or the governance capability is not just about keep pushing new rules. It's also about taking away if it doesn't make sense anymore. Mm, true. So that, that, that for me resonates quite strongly with theory of constraints. Um, yeah. They're all cousins. All of this stuff, we're, we're, we're all looking at the, the same elephant from slightly different angles. Just the TST angle happens to be the most interesting. That, that's yeah. all that's the only difference <laughs> here's a fascinating pattern that i've seen quite a number of times in various organizations there's this tendency for people to say look i'm exhausted i'm overwhelmed uh, i'm so busy uh, don't give me more theory mm-hmm. just tell me pragmatically what to do mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> what's your reaction to this situation Yes, is my answer. <laughs> they need both. Um, there, there has to be some theory there. Um, and actually, it's one of the curses of the theory constraints. Ellie Goldratt, if he wasn't um, already deceased, should have been shot for um, <laughs> calling it the theory constraints because he got like the three most boring words in the world, uh, theory <laughs> of and constraints and, and pull them together. Um, but if, if you forget about the TOC angle, there, there is that thing that, that um, if we go to help people, it's really, it's, sorry, I'm going to put it slightly different. There's this bias for action, which is actually wonderful and also a real curse. Um, uh, I, I learned this word just a couple of weeks ago, um, procrastination, which is the opposite of procrastination, which is when you just get in just to get things moving. And, you, and, and uh, p- people will mock you guys for this, but um, they didn't hear that before we started this, you had a definition of ready to kick this off so that you didn't make any, you, you got rid of most of the mistakes. Um, and so there's a lot to be said for having a little bit of thought, slowing down and being a bit boring and sensible about things and not just acting. Um, now, a lot of people don't like the theory and a lot of people don't need the theory. Um, they just need to know what to do. But I think that's a bit of a red herring. I think in most pace, th- there are some people who just want to know what to do, um, but I think they are maybe not the ones who you want to be helping because they're just, they'll, they'll just do what they're told. Um, it's the ones that actually push back. You, 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 you want to have, a problem solving session with them rather than a solution giving one and you want to it, it's kind of like you yoda and luke you, you want to be yoda you want to help luke um learn how to do some special things um but you still want luke to go and fight the battles and and so this people listening to this might throw up at the thought of this but you've actually got to think like a salesperson 
and and, and I really struggle with this because you know I think like a lot of us we go salesperson but what a good salesperson does is listens to the person um and tries to figure out oh, what are the problems you've got oh okay all right yeah what, what what's the implications of those problems you know are they causing you pain I think oh not really I just like to moan oh okay no no we, we, we can't help you with that no no they do really cause me pain um these problems you've described a real headache I go home at night and I can't sleep because of it and I'm worried I'm gonna have to lay people off oh okay so you'd like to Okay, well, what what would be the benefit of? And, and so we go through, you know, a very respectful. It's, it's if if when we're selling ideas and helping people, we call it coaching and mentoring. Um, but we if we start with problems first, rather than um, solutions that we try and ram at people's throats. We, we we effectively then can get, like I mentioned with um, Bob and his boss, we can figure out how to get other people what they want by helping them solve their problems, um, and by doing that, we get what we want. Um, so I, I think a lot of uh, one of the curses of um, all of us clever people doing this stuff is that and, and uh, you know, we end up with a huge bunch of problem solving um, you know, solutions. We end up with a huge bunch of solutions that we can pull out of our toolkits and give to people anytime and help them. Um, but I think the most useful part, and it sounds so cliched, um, is to sit down and actually listen to them and figure out what problems they have and, and then try and help them solve their problems. And, and, and that way it, it, it tends to stick because, you know, they've got the IKEA effect. Once they've got the, the stuff, they, they do a lot of the work themselves. And so it's just going to be, um, they're going to value it more and it's going to stick more. So I think I avoided your question by answering another one that I... <laughs> <laughs> You did a little bit because it's a tricky question. Yeah. <laughs> it is tough, right? Because <clears throat> you're absolutely right that we have to have compassion. Um, when people are particularly expressing that um, mental exhaustion, part of it comes from this um, insidious tendency to want to do too much. Hmm. So in other words, we're paying very little, if any, attention to what's our work in process. Yep. Um, too yep. often you find organizations like um, project management offices or, or things like that. And you ask, so how many initiatives do you have on the go? And they will say, oh, 357. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how many project managers do you have? 12. Right. Yep. So right. 300 projects, 12 people kind of looking after these. So how much time do they actually have during a week to, to look at these um, initiatives? It's like uh, about um, 30 projects per person. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so less than an hour each. <laughs> it's it like, isn't real cool. One of the things that there's two two things that come out of the theory constraints that, that are really that they're not so well known. Most people think bottlenecks you know, with theory constraints or making money, you know, those two things. But there's one of them is this really counterintuitive idea um, that working on multiple things at once. Um, most people think that gets more done, uh, but um, goal drafts. He, he really cleverly um he, he he came up with some stuff that showed that if you actually have multiple projects running at once they're just diluted and it's so counterintuitive and if you get it you, you, you know well, the, if you start stuff you just end up with lots of things half done um if you start stuff and stagger their starts um you get things finished um much 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 more quickly and it's not even the the task switching cost that that, that is actually that it's the most obvious thing the, it's the actual delay um that dilution causes before you get the value from the projects it's it's just shockingly um bad but it requires someone to make a, a really surprising decision which is i'm going to stop starting things and i know we, we know this stuff now um and then i'm um uh going to just let things slow down and and by slowing everything down they'll actually speed up but it's so counterintuitive um if people just go there it doesn't make any sense but um the, the thing that goldrick did and it's uh, hidden in the depths of the the theory constraints so most people don't know this it's like one of those little light bulbs where you go oh um i remember him drawing this this chart and it kind of shows the uh, it's like the you know it, it, I can't remember what the name of the the diagram is, but it's 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 you've probably seen it when people map out motorway traffic, 
um, for utilization, how, how slow it is. And the, um, there's this thing that if you actually reduce the number of active projects um, by 20 to 25%, um, and you can just do that just by stopping, not, not when you stop one, don't start another one, and then don't start another one, and then you've just suddenly done it. Um, reducing it only by 25% is kind of like what happens on the, 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 the motorway, um, where at 20 past eight, it's maxed out and really slow. And then at five past nine, 25% less traffic, and it's moving a lot um, faster. The other angle that from the theory constraints, it just really kind of it's basically the, the theory constraints is this uh, it, actually i've got a new name for the theory constraints um uh much better than the theory constraints is corporate corporate acupuncture so you know if you get acupuncture it, it's very very targeted um, I, points. yeah and it's very 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 thin needle so thin you don't even feel it that that's what the theory constraints is trying to do and that's in, in my atm model it's about projects it's about um turbocharged delivery and it's about a quiet approach to um change and and that's what the the acupuncture idea is that if you can um the, the key thing is don't just drive in and try and change everything and fix it but just sit back and very carefully look around and then just find that one bit where you can just stick the needle um and you'll see everything will release and it's just one of those things over and over and over again, you say it, you, you see it and, and it works. The trouble is that no one sees it apart from a few people because it's just so quiet. Um, things get better and they don't see it. People see a lot of transformation projects and they see those and they hate them um, and they get worn down by them, uh, but they actually see something and, and that, so they know a change has happened. If, if you fix something um, and no one knows it's been fixed, um, it, it, it's, that's the downside of being um, very, very quiet, quiet and clever. Yeah, sorry, I, and, and I'm over talking now, so I'll stop now. <laughs> it's uh, it's really good. I love the idea of the corporate acupuncture. Um, here's another um, interesting situation I've come across. I wonder what your take uh, on it is. I was describing uh, to a customer the importance of play. Um, mm. in the in the workplace to uh to actually uh generate innovation and um and mm -hmm. engage people and i got the following reaction uh but i'm here to work i'm not here to play <laughs> yes i would agree with both of you <laughs> so i think both are true um but it depends what was played to some people so, so th th there was this thing that uh, i'm introverted right um, and I love going to conferences, though. I'm not shy. Uh, uh, I love going to conferences. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll keynote something. People do this. I'll, I'll, I'll have people um, singing songs as part of the thing and do all sorts of stuff. Uh, but then when you go off to a group, uh, to a session, if it's a group session and they're going to do playful stuff, I go, oh, you're off. off. I, I just, 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 just tell me what the answer is because actually, or I'll sit back and I'll just watch and I'll figure out what's actually happening because I don't enjoy that, but other people love it. So I think there's a preference thing um, going on there. But, but I think that the key is that different people like to play in different ways. Um, so for me, um, being playful m might be playing around with words. Um, and I know you guys have done this, um, you know, with your, you know, playing with the word oversight. And I bet you were delighted when you go, oh, has a double meaning, has a double meaning. Oh, brilliant. And, and, and you play around with that and, it, and, and that gives you joy. But that's work at the same time. Um, the, uh, and, and then other people, they enjoy um, having those more extroverted things where they, they might have a session where they do all sorts of things and play games and stuff like that. And, and that gives them um, maybe the benefit they get is that they get, um, I, I, I've no idea what benefit they get out of it, but a lot of people seem to enjoy that kind of stuff. I, I think the thing is that there are there are preferences and, and play can take many forms, but I, I think the bit that you would be bugged about, I, I think, is that you've actually got to have space um, in order to play. And if you don't, you end up with, like, like a lot of Agile teams, where um, before Agile, they used to have a lot of, time in waterfall where you could sit and think and do clever stuff and create before it got chucked into the development um phase um and so there was, there was a lot of creativity there um and then a lot of i don't know if people still use this term in agile but um early on we used to refer to it as iterationitis we just got the relentless 
oh, uh, oh, there's two weeks. Thank goodness. Oh, goodness, there's another two weeks. We just started again. Mm -hmm. And it just says this wearing down. So if you don't have the slack built in mm -hmm. um, to let people play, then, then you, you end up being very, very inefficient. You, you lose out on the creativity, yeah. um, but you also lose out on the relaxingness Okay, I, I've got to tell you this. This, this, is, uh, this is two of my heroes, even though one of them I think was a real prick. If you, you can edit that out later. Um, <laughs> Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, right? Um, and Ellie Goldratt. So Ellie Goldratt, I got an email from him once, um, and this one wasn't directly to me. It went out to a bunch of people, and he was apologizing because he had this whole lot of stuff. That This was probably 1997, 98, something like that. And he sent this thing out and he said, I'm really sorry. I was meant to send this out to you all last week, but I got stuck playing video games. And you go, what? what? That's, that's my hero who must surely just, and it, but he's playing video games. And then um, you got uh, the Steve Jobs. I can't remember. It was something, I, th I think it was just some blog post with some guy that worked with him. And he said it was weird. He kept going to meetings. And, and in between meetings, Steve would sit there and play a little Atari game or something like this. And it just disappeared. And you go, here's this guy that was changing the world and stuff. Um, and he just sit down and he just disappeared and, and you know, uh, on a, sit on a seat and play a video game. You go, that doesn't fit with the the, the, the match. But but they were both building in space to let their their, their brains um, just, just come down. And I don't know. I'll, I'll keep, there's another one I've learned recently that um, bees have a that they have um, half, but about no. I think it's ten to twenty percent of every beehive has some completely useless bees that are really lazy, and they fly out and they 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 wander off and they just amble around and they just bzz, 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 all by themselves. All the other ones are busy being worker bees and they're busy collecting stuff. And these other ones, they're explorer bees, and they wander around. And most of the time, they come back with nothing. And then other times, they find a new source of food. And they get to bring that back. Uh, and if the, the beehives of the past that didn't have those explorer, those lazy, lazy um, explorer bees that didn't have those bees, they, they didn't survive. They, they never survived when um, their main food source got destroyed. Um, the ones that had the explorer bees had somewhere else they could go. So I, 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 I'm on your side. The play is great. But I, 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 I just think, I suspect the word, um, uh, some people might love the word play. Other people might love the word creativity. Others might um, use it um, flexible, reactive. Um, Slack time. Yeah, <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, uh, there, it's a challenge more of perception than anything else. Because yep. if we associate play with frivolity, with yes. uh, working in a manner that isn't valuable, it's yep. just a, a waste. If we're equating that with play, then absolutely. Why would we waste our time on yep. ridiculousness, right? So we have a, a, a partner that uh, is, is deeply um, upset whenever um, people... Uh, claim, oh, uh, we're going to have an agile something or other, and it's going to be expressed in interpretive dance. It's like, <laughs> come on, <laughs> really? <laughs> it's like, okay, fine. <laughs> there is such a thing as taking play a little bit too far. <laughs> uh, and I think a lot of it's just situational, and it's the choice of words, and it, it's the diff It's you know, like if I mention bottleneck, um, uh, and I say, for, for, just for instance, um developers should be the bottleneck and then so many people go no no we don't want a bottleneck it's, well you're going to have one and, and then you end up in an argument um about it so sometimes i'll call the bot that i'll refer to a flagship resource and at the end i will explain that you know it's the one that actually everyone um every other resource around them has spare capacity so that the flagship can perform um at, at, you know at, at, at its best and if you think of the formula one cars uh, that are driving around the pit crew aren't they busy all the time they're busy being they're, they're they're being very proactively reactive waiting for the car to come in and so just using different words like that is sometimes necessary but then I can't help myself and I'll have to explain actually they are a bottleneck but they're a strategic bottleneck um, but, but again it's, it's a, a word that triggers some people sometimes this is the curse of it if everyone else would just do as they're told life would be a lot easier <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> <laughs> and therein lies the challenge yes. because I'd love to be able to tell people what to do, except oh. that I cannot be there to notice what needs noticing. Oh, I know. So therefore, my advice is likely in many cases to be not quite suited for what's happening. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you give them the light bulb. And then let them use their judgment. Um, <clears throat> and 99% of the time, people come up with something better than what, what us clever folks could. Um, and, but that, that takes a big leap in, in, um, in wisdom, I think, to get to a point where you feel comfortable uh, doing that. It's not, not a natural, it's, it's, an, it's not a natural mode to be, to be the Yoda. Mm, it's, mm. it's far more natural to want to be the Luke that's actually out flying the battles. <laughs> The hero. Oh, oh. oh yes, yes. Yeah. Here's another thing on constraints that I find really fascinating. Often you ask people, so in our organization, what do you reckon is the constraint right now? And um, in, most of the time, people will gravitate towards some form of inanimate something or other. I, we don't yeah. have enough of this or not enough of those, not enough environments, not enough licenses, not enough um, whatever. Um, when in fact, as we well know, the constraint most likely in a knowledge mm -hmm. economy isn't anything physical, it's actually humans. It's who has the right skill and insight and ability to transform this set of yep. pieces of information into an insight to go, oh, Right. So this is the outcome that we ought to be uh, focusing on. So, for instance, an interesting pattern that I've seen in some organizations is you get some clever technology executives that uh, when they join with the organization, the first thing that they do is they go and visit and notice uh, what the flow of the work is in the organization. And they identify who the most in-demand specialists are. Mm -hmm. So everybody needs Mary because Mary is the best at such and such. And everybody needs Joe, right? And then the executive kind of gets Mary and Joe into their office and say, guys, I have a present for you. You're going to love it. Here are some oven mitts, right? <laughs> you will not touch keyboards for the next month. Ah. <laughs> you will wear the oven mitts. <laughs> mm -hmm. What you will do instead is you will teach people your magic. Mm -hmm. you, you you will be um, um, Miss um, McGonagall and um, Mr. Dumbledore, right? Yep. Teaching people your magic, yeah? Such that you're no longer the key most in-demand person that uh, uh, we're, we're stuck. And by the way, you're going to also mm. be able to go on holiday comfortably and safely. And by the way, this is not a precursor to me getting rid of you or firing yes. you or, or making you indispensable such that I can negotiate better your next um, salary raise or anything like that, right? So, but the, in, the idea of notice where the kind of natural demand points are and deliberately work to relax them is part of that acupuncture that you were describing. Yes. That re requires interesting um, it, oversight. It does. Uh, social can I, engineering. <laughs> what was that, sorry? Social engineering. Interesting social engineering. Yeah, and I think what happens, um, in fact, I just half an hour before I got on the call with you guys, I, I was actually having that discussion um, with uh, the, the, the leader of a, a team, um, and, and what we got to, uh, it was slightly different. It, 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 I'm trying to convince her, without convincing her, um, that she should stick to what she's actually really good at, um, which is a, which is not programming, but it's a. Re, it, she's extremely good at figuring out how to test in their old legacy system, and it's like magic. And it's it's for her, it's an unconscious competence that she's really good at it and she finds it hard to teach people how to do things differently um but what i'm trying to do with her there's one bit that she doesn't know i'm trying to do with her yet which is to convince her to get someone that can pick up some of the admin stuff that she dislikes um and has to do um and fortunately I, i've got 
um, her boss, we, we, we kind of had a similar thing where she needed a two IC, someone who could actually just, you just hand stuff to and trust to them. And, and that, that will make things a lot easier for her. But because she's a leader, she feels like she also has to do the, the, the management. Um, but she's effectively, you know, it, it very good at the actual getting stuff done. Um, so, so what we're trying to do, it, it's, it's the strangest thing, um, but I'm trying to get her to hand that over by getting them to, um, just facilitate just little sessions with her team um, where they do, uh, I suppose, you, I don't know what you could call it, um, test first thinking. Um, I, I don't know what, it, what what people call it nowadays, but in, in Rolling Rocks Downhill, I, I had a story, you know, that which was at the centre of it. And it was about the idea of, you know, before you build something, just, just figure out how you're going to test it and, and don't go document everything to the details, but do that as a discussion. So her and I are, are, are looking at that. And what we're trying to do is to keep her doing the stuff that she loves um, and, and get some of the, make some of the unconscious competence um, conscious, you know, make it, make it a bit more explicit, um, but to teach it to other people, but at the same time, make sure that she's, she's still, you know, T-shaped, um, that she's not giving away everything and abandoning the stuff that actually kind of actually brings her quite a lot of joy. Mm. Um, but, but she's giving away the, the, 20, the 80% of it that isn't really particularly challenging. Um, and, and, you know, the, you know, the, the, the T-shirt thing is, when I heard that, um, uh, Don, Don Reinertsen, um, it, you know, it was just such an obvious thing when he said it. And, and I'd seen it before, but it was just it's such an important thing that, that um, experts don't have to do everything in their expertise, but they should also not chuck away the stuff that they're really expert at um, because it's too hard to give away. And it's the stuff that actually um, makes them smile. So, so I, I think that's there. But I, I like the, you know, people coming in, they can identify these vital few people. Um, but if they turn their jobs into misery um, uh, by trying to make them ultra efficient, there, there, there's loads of ways of handling that. Um, but it's, it's yeah, at the end of the day, you don't want to turn your, your star players into um, board um, leaders uh, who have been given a promotion and are earning more money but don't like their jobs or something like that. Very good. I like the uh, fact you earlier in this call, you talked about storytelling and um, I'm, I want to invite you to uh, share mm -hmm. a story where you've noticed that an oversight uh, function or an oversight context, um, what was a good story to tell around that? Hmm. Where it actually was effective and efficient and Now, I'm going to give you an analogy instead, if I can, because I can't think of a direct story. Um, but I, I think there's for, for for some time I worked as a consultant for a water company in Scotland, and they were the only water company in Scotland, and they were called Scottish Water. <laughs> there you go. That's not the story. <laughs> um, but they kept saying they would all repeat the same thing to me over and over it was just like it was like their mantra that they used to almost justify themselves to, to make them feel important because nobody loved them um nobody loved them um they either hated them or didn't know they were there and they would say to me all the time you know no one cares about us unless their water stops working so, so you imagine, you don't care about the water company. I mean, I, I don't know, I presume there's a tap comes and hit our place somehow. Um, if it stopped working, suddenly I would care about it. And so that whole company, they basically kept things running and they were invisible until something went wrong. And I reckon it's the same with, um, that the, if you you pick a programmer, say, or a tester or um, anyone that's you know actually getting their hands dirty, doing the direct um, coal face work, they don't have a clue what happens above until things go wrong. And so often you will actually have people at the, that, 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 that middle management level who are keeping things running around. And I think that's kind of the level you mean by, by insight. Um, and, and, and there'll be levels above that and levels deeper in it. But they, they have no idea um, that other stuff is running until it stops working. And then they hate them and they think they're bad at their job. Uh, and and that's it's not answering your question, but it's a real curse because no one values them, um, and people 
only think they do a bad job because the only time they see them is when um, something goes wrong and they see them doing a bad job. They never see that middle level. You, you know, it's, it, the stuff you're talking about, a lot of it is like buying an insurance policy. Um, you know, you, the last thing you want to do is actually um, make good on your insurance policy. Hey, yeah, it was brilliant. Our house burnt down and we got um, uh, half a million dollars back out of that. Woohoo! No, you don't want that. And it's the same with your level there. You want it to be mostly invisible, but it creates this, this like this curse of excellence. If you're invisible, you actually, you're doing a fantastic job and you look worse for it. And actually, I suppose I can give you a story now that I've given that. I'm just thinking of, of um, uh, the, the I, I mentioned before that I, I helped a, a lady get a second in command. You know, she's like an executive level and she had a lot of stuff on and, and she got, um, it, it took quite a lot of conversations of me um, trying to be as Socratic as I can without, you know, without forcing, um, uh, but, but just trying to get the idea of you need a, um, a, a second in command. You need a, a chief of staff. It's like, have you watched the West Wing? And you've got Leo McGarry, who's the president's chief of staff, and they, they do different things, but they work really well together. And I think you need that. Um, and, and and it took quite a while. But when she got that person, um, and it was a, it took a while to get the right person to actually believe that it was the right person, her whole world changed. But she couldn't see how it would change until it did. Um, and I've noticed that with other clients around the place. There's another company I'm working with and there are only about 35, 40 people. And it's the same thing. This, this, the CEO needs a, a chief of staff. And we talked about it. An interesting thing in both those cases, um, they didn't get the obvious person. Um, they got the right person who was not obvious, but it was someone that they knew through a, a different connection to work that they could trust. Um, and, and they filled that gap. So I, I think because of the theory of constraints and things, I, I think about gaps and, and where, where there's not enough of, a, of, of resources. And, and, and you kind of have this donut problem. You, you know, a donut's round and it's got a hole in the middle. Um, a, lot of, a lot of teams and organizations are like that. They've neutered the middle um, of, of the organization. So there's, there's not enough in the middle there. Um, and, and, and so it's great if you're a donut because that's part of the feature. But if you're an organization, often that level that's doing the stuff that you guys are interested in, um, they don't value it um, and they don't resource it up enough um, and they only see it when it goes bad, which then has a reinforcing loop that they don't value it. Uh, and it's a, it's a curse. And I hope I've just made up a whole lot of stuff there that sounded really interesting as I spoke it. <laughs> it was vaguely useful. No, thank oh, you for that, Clark. That, uh, that, that's a good description of what, some of the patterns that we do notice. So thank you. Mm -hmm. cool. Interesting challenge here is we have so many counter examples and it's so much easier to poke fun at things. I mean, you mm -hmm. have, let's say Dilbert and yeah. his point, pointy haired boss. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you have shows like the office and so on, but until only very recently, it was nigh on impossible to point out to a, to a TV show as to what's a really great work environment like. Yes. Yeah. Do you have one in mind? Was I do. Uh, Ted Lasso uh, comes to ah, mind. Right? Yes. Yeah. So if you look at that kind of interesting sort of strategic yet um, effective way of, of leadership <coughs> and, and, and coaching, Ted Lasso is, is hitting a, a really beautiful spot mm. because it's it's incisive, it's tender, it's uh, real, it's effective, and it has some some really um, interesting lessons. Um, and it's funny, and it's rude. It, so. is, it is also quite amusing in, yes. in, in various ways. But um, the thing is, um, my, my point was until something like Ted Lasso, we hardly have any examples of what's it like. Um, usually in um, the various um, movies, uh, or, or TV shows, um, who's the the evil mm, person? The guy right? in the suit. <laughs> it's it's some person that's uh, some corporate uh, heartless um, thug that mm. is out to ruin nature and and so on. We we don't have that many examples of genuine, compassionate, caring, insightful um, 
courageous um, executives, yeah. leaders, uh, managers. It's because they're invisible. And there you go. And there's a there's a missing story there. Um, mm. In the um, I'll, I'll use a broad generalization here. In the broader agile community, um, there is often this feeling of oh, managers are bad. Mm. Yeah. So therefore, there's almost um, an inbuilt sense of disdain uh, towards management. Yep. Which is actually tremendously counterproductive and it's destructive. Brutally exactly. destructive. Yeah. Yeah. Because what we want instead is we want to be able to respect our managers. And we want our managers to be worthy of that respect. And we need their help and their support and their um, sort of ability to hold space, to make it safe for us to emerge yeah. out of, put it this way, nobody is perfect at anything. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody comes into the world perfect at anything. So the challenge is, how do we take a number of imperfect people and blend, yes. them, blend them together into a community that somehow magically transforms from a bunch of people into a team? Mm. Yeah? Because ultimately, that is what really changes things. When we have teams that really care more about each other than they mm. care about personal comfort. Yeah. And it is really helpful. I, I, I genuinely, sadly think that um, Agile has made things a lot worse by the anti-management vibe, which is actually, if you imagine it, though, you've got a hierarchy. Um, and if we're all tribal, um, and there's only that many people at the top of the, the hierarchy, that little tiny tip that's sticking out above the, the, the top of the sea, and they're the managers, it, it's very easy to dislike that tiny lot where you don't understand the, their world. And, and I think a, a lot of the behaviors in Agile have been going, no, they're not necessary. They did a whole lot of stuff that was bad, but it wasn't the, it was the systems and, and we changed the systems. You know, that, that's kind of like that, that fundamental thing that it really annoys me when you see people who quote Deming um, and, 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 and are all wonderful, well-meaning, lovely people. And they quote Deming um, about all these wonderful things he said. Uh, and they'll even quote that uh, bit about how, you know, it's not um, people that are problem, it's systems that are the problem. And then in the following sentence, they'll blame the people, which are the managers. <laughs> and, but, but it's understandable because of the tribal nature of things and the, the, the very few managers relative to the other roles that we will blame them um, based on the th way things were in the past. And that is actually genuinely the bit that drove me about um, rolling rocks downhill, trying to write it, was trying to help people see that you don't just need a bottom-up ag agile or a top-down, you need a middle out. Because mm -hmm. those people in the middle, um, they like you said, um, Horia, you, they, they make space. They make space um, and they protect, um, but they also, they don't just work inwards to the team. Um, they, they build bridges outside the team. Uh, and, and there's just so many things. Where I'm sure you guys have seen it yourself. It's, it's those connections that you make um, beyond that where you help someone today, um, that, that, that in a few years' time, uh, you come back to them and say, I'm really stuck, and they help you back. And there's so many things about that. It's, it's the... the, the there are three fundamental um, uh, behaviors of middle managers. Um, and one of them is to build the team uh, internally. Uh, I can't remember what the second one is, though I, I could have you gave me a moment to look it up. Um, the third one is to, to build bridges externally. Um, and I think, you could, yeah, you could, yeah. So the, actually the second one could be oversight. Uh, I'm, I'm quoting in a Harvard Business Review, business review paper that um, confirmed exactly what I believe. So I think it must be true. Um, <laughs> but those, uh, there's the internal stuff to the team, helping them gel and work together, which is really important. There's the, probably there's the oversight and the, all that other stuff that goes on to keep them running that no one knows or cares about. Um, and then there's the bridge building that's outside that helps them function as a part of a much bigger organization and if you've neutered that particular role your whole company um is neutered um and 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 is is 
sub-performing, but you get a situation where everyone's really, really, really busy um, and they mistake that for productivity. Mm. Um, yeah. so I, I'm on your side. I agree. I think you're <laughs> right. Right. So to try and wrap this up, um, let me ask you, what haven't we asked you that we should have? What haven't you asked me? I think due to the way my personality works, I've probably said everything that I found interesting, <laughs> no matter what you asked me. Um, what happened? Is there anything? Actually, can I, 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 there's a bit, I'll give you the answer. It's like, oh, how do we get copies of your um, books for free? And it's like, um, just, just find me on LinkedIn. There's only, there's two Clark Chings and the other guy's a dentist um, in Canada <laughs> and I'm not him. Um, bizarrely, we are actually related because of our surname, uh, but you would have to go back to the 1820s when one boat went to Canada and one boat went to New Zealand. But I'm not him. Contact me and just 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 connect with me and just say, could I have a copy of the book? I'm, I'm not trying to get connections on LinkedIn. I've got more than enough of those. I'm just, <laughs> it's just the easiest way to track me down and get the book. Um, or, I think you book. also name yourself Clark, the bottleneck guy, Ching. I so, do. I do. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So. Um, if if, yeah. if you do a search and you see the bottleneck guy in the, in the <laughs> name, then then that's how you find Clark. Uh, to make it easier for our audience, we're actually going to add your um, LinkedIn oh, link cool. in the podcast uh, description, so it'll be easy for people to to get to it. Excellent. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for putting up with me. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Clark, for uh, for your time and uh, sharing the sunshine in the middle of winter. Believe it mm. or not, it happens in New Zealand. Um, yeah, well, not in Wellington all the time. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for your time, uh, Clark, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. I'm Aldu. I'm Horia, and today we thank Clark so much. Thank you. Cheers.